So, performance subsecond view. Uh, my name is Lucas Still, and I am a full stack architect with Moe's Create. And as a full stack architect, I like to look at the full stack when developing applications for clients. And so over the past couple years of working with Vue, I've gathered a couple of performance tips along the way, and I'd like to share those with you today. So one quick clarification first, this isn't Nuxt. Nuxt is an absolutely great framework, but this gets a little more into the configuration nitty gritty. Um, and then second thing I wanna get to, a little off topic, by a show of hands, who here recycles? Okay, about half might want to be careful. But uh, all jokes aside, uh, whether you grew up with Captain Planet or you're an avid Marvel fan, uh, it's a well-known fact that there's strength in numbers. And so with this talk, I would like to share with you how you can combine seven independent technologies and by their powers combined, you can create a view app that delivers web pages in sub-second time. So jumping right into it, the first obvious view, it's why you're here, it's why I'm here, you love it, I love it. It's the glue that holds the next six technologies together and with key aspects of the view architecture, it's what really drives the performance of the next six. So I'm not gonna spend too much time here because everyone else has. Two, the service worker. Who uses service workers? Okay, cool. So a service worker, for those of you that haven't used it yet, it basically is a technology that allows your web app to preload files ahead of time before they're actually needed. And if you've made a PWA or a progressive web app, guaranteed you're already using a service worker because it's one of the main components of the PWA. And so you're not necessarily gonna increase the performance of the first page load speed, but for all subsequent pages, it's really gonna dramatically reduce the time to load those pages. Third technology, Webpack. Who here uses Webpack? Okay, a lot more, great. So I feel a little like Thor without his hammer here because Jennifer did such a great job at stealing my thunder yesterday on her presentation. So I'm just gonna summarize a little. So the job of Webpack is to bundle your code and in the process, it does a pretty good job at removing dead or unused code. And so basically your final files that you're delivering to your, the user in the browser are gonna be smaller but with a little bit of configuration and a couple plugins, you actually can do a bit more. So you can minify the code, so that's gonna take the bundle and make it a little bit smaller. And then with some special chunking, uh, this is what's gonna let you to enhance your long-term caching, and so this way you can make sure that your users don't download the same piece of code twice. Why bother, it didn't change. Okay, fourth technology. This here is a big one. It's a CDN, who here uses CDNs? Great, good, a bit more. So for those of you that don't use a CDN or aren't exactly sure what it is, you can think of it a little bit like this. When you're developing your application on your local computer, uh, it's accessible to you and sometimes it's accessible to those on your network. Anyone loading up the app, the files are gonna load almost instantaneously. That's great. However, for those that aren't on your network, they don't even have access to your web app. So you decide next step, go ahead and put it on a server, in-house, in the cloud, and great, now people around the world can access your web app, but two problems. So those that are loading your web app around the globe, they're gonna be at the mercy of one, the upload speed of your server's internet connection. So if you have a really slow internet connection, you're not able to serve the files fast enough to those users. And then number two, latency. If your server is in the United States and you have someone trying to access your server from Australia, there's a good chance that every single request that they make is gonna experience some latency. So this is where the CDN takes in. And so a CDN is basically servers that are positioned in key locations all around the world, tens, hundreds of locations. And so they're gonna take your static files and serve them to clients when they request them. So for all of those static files that aren't gonna change, instead of having to go all the way to your server for them, they can go to a server that's very close to them that has pretty much breakneck speed servers that are gonna upload the files as fast as people can download them and with minimal latency. Fifth technology, compression. Who here uses compression? Cool, okay, you might use it without actually uh, knowing you're using it. Uh, a lot of CDNs out there, they pre-compress your assets, but in a nutshell, compression is a trade-off. So with compression, it's gonna make the files that are transferred to your user smaller. So whereas you might have a 200 kilobyte file, in order to get it to the user, you can compress it using one of these uh, two compression algorithms, make it down to maybe 50 kilobytes, send it over the wire, and then the client, here's where the trade-off, they have to spend a little bit of time to decompress it to get it back to its original shape and size. Uh, in general though, uh, with most, most types of files, you're gonna see a really good decrease in the overall time it takes to get the file from your CDN or your server to the client's browser. And so 
gzip and Brotling. They're two of the main forms of compression out there, supported by most major browsers. It actually makes a difference which one you choose. So uh, with Brotling, the reason you'll want to choose this one is that it has a little bit of a trade-off advantage. Its compression algorithm is smaller, so a file that gzip might be able to get down to 50 kilobytes, Brotling might be able to get it down to 40 or 30. And this comes at the trade-off, though, is that its algorithm takes a little bit longer to run. So if you're pre-compressing your assets ahead of time, doesn't matter. You can suffer that cost at your build step, put your files up with Brotly, and it should save time, overall page load time, for your users. However, with gzip, since its compression is a little bit faster, the algorithm is a little faster to run, if you have dynamic pages that you're trying to cache on the fly and you know these pages can't be cached, that would be a good opportunity to use gzip because it's overall the page load time, even though it's not going to get as smaller, you're not paying the price of gzipping it, or excuse me, broadly compressing it on the fly. The third bullet I have here is for graphics. I uh, just wanted to point out, to make sure everyone's aware, there are other types of compressions, particularly like image formats, ping. Ping is already compressed. Do not gzip it again. Do not Brantley it again. It's already compressed. You're not going to get any smaller. And you might actually pay the price of a longer time to get this file because the browser has to uncompress un something that's already been compressed. Uh, if you really want to satisfy our users, switch to SVGs. Don't use pings. Don't use JPEGs. Go to vector. It's a lot better. OK, switching gears. Back in now. Who uses SSR? OK, we're really narrowing down here. So SSR, server-side rendering. Uh, there's a lot that can be said here, particularly on the SEO side of the fence. Uh, that's not what I'm going to dig into today. I'm more going to the performance side of the picture. So three big things. Uh, two are going to be time-based. So first is the time to paint, and the second is time to interactive. And these are two big things that SSR is going to help with. So time to first paint. This is the amount of time it takes for the browser to go from white to some semblance of your app. And then time to interactive, this is the time it takes the browser to go from white to the user actually being able to click on things in, in your app. And so with SSR, as I'm sure a lot of you already know, it's gonna pre-scaffold out and give a rough version of your app to the, uh, to the user, to the browser, rather than it having to take the blank files and build something up. It's a good first draft that it can just instantly show to the user. And then the second thing here is inline critical CSS. And so what this means is that typically when you include your CSS files, you include them as files in your head. And the problem with this is that it's gonna block the render until all those files are downloaded. Where SSR can be uh, configured here to help out is that it's gonna take only the styles that are needed for that first page, inline them into the head, and then let your service worker, or uh, if you preload files, let those take care of loading in the background all the rest of the CSS files for the rest of the pages. This will dramatically reduce the amount of time for that first paint. All right, here's the fun one, the seventh technology. This is kind of the new kid on the block. Who here uses edge computing? Or you might know it as Cloudflare Workers or Lambda at Edge. Okay, cool, we got a couple of people using it. So remember when I talked about CDN and it was a great way to have servers all around the world and they would serve your static files? Well, big companies like Amazon and Cloudflare have found out a way to one-up that. So now instead of just serving your static files, they can actually serve your dynamic files as well. So they do this by letting you use their servers that are at all these edge locations. You can run your SSR code on those servers and then serve your dynamic files at a location that is close to the end users. And even better than that, if you can even put a small cache time on those dynamic pages, suddenly they're static pages. So you're rendering on the fly, you don't have to guess at how long your pages that would be dynamic have to last. You can just say, all right, I know these pages are roughly gonna last about five, 10 minutes. The first user's gonna pay the price of loading up that dynamic page, and then everyone else, it's kinda like you pre-rendered it. It's like a static page, super fast. And so I wanna come up here and speak all this witchcraft to you without showing you some of the proof in the pudding. And so on the left side of the screen here, this is where I've combined these seven technologies into some code. You can take home, shake it, bake it, make it work. Um, this is definitely not a one size fits most Thanos glove. This is just one particular way to make these technologies work together. There's a lot of different ways to do it. This is just one example of that. Uh, then showing you here on the right side of the screen, this is Chrome's Lighthouse tool. I went ahead and deployed uh, this repo out to the cloud and ran Chrome's Lighthouse tool. And two things I want to point out on it here. Time to first paint, 0.1 second, and time to interactive, 0.2 seconds. Now this was a dynamic page. I did not pre-cache it ahead of time, but 
refresh it once, and then it acts as if it's a static page. This is the same thing you can do for every single page in your app. Now, obviously, you're going to take this with a grain of salt because it's a small demo app. It's going to go a little bit faster, but I have used this in enterprise implementations, and the results are equally impressive. Thank you.